before us, this is the first day of the new semester, and what a marvelous way to begin. New students, the Board of Trustees, all the returning students, I won't call you old students, <laughs> and then the Board of Trustees are here for two days. So this is the Gordon Conwell family, and so we have gathered as a family for conversation with our leader and chair of the Board of Trustees, Mr. Billy Graham. And so we give a welcome to you, Billy, for being with us Thank today. You. Dr. Christopher Lyon, a member of our Board of Trustees, is going to lead us in our opening prayer. Dr. Lyon. Let's pray together. God of Heavenly Father, we thank you for this afternoon and for this uh, great convocation, this great opportunity to come together. How we thank you for Dr. Graham and his worldwide ministry. How we thank you, Father, for the consistency of his life. How we thank you for the fact that it's so obvious that he loves Jesus. We love you too, Lord Jesus, and we gather together in your name. Amen. Amen. In 1969, three gentlemen, one a philanthropist, Mr. J. Howard Pugh, the other a pastoral theologian, Dr. Harold John Ockengay, and the other an evangelist, Mr. Billy Graham, joined together in planning the merger of the Conwell School of Theology and the Gordon Divinity School. And out of their vision and out of their dreams, we stand today on this campus with this institution and with all of us gathered in this wonderful moment. I think it's fair to say that we enjoy marvelous facilities, a very exciting vision, and a burden for taking Christ to all of the world because of the leadership of one of those persons, Mr. Billy Graham. And so it's our joy to have this conversation today with Mr. Graham, and we look forward to his sharing his vision with us and then giving you an opportunity to ask him some questions and to learn better of that vision. Thank you for being with us, Billy. Thank you. Uh -oh. The reason I'm having such a struggle is I've just gotten out of the hospital where I had to have a small tumor removed from my left foot. So if I am a little bit right-footed, it's uh, because of that. But I deeply appreciate the gracious and generous words that Dr. Cooley had to say. I'm sorry that I haven't been able to attend all the meetings of the trustees, but look forward to tonight and tomorrow, and especially to be with you. I didn't know uh, that I was going to have such an uh, opportunity as this. I heard that I would be answering some questions with some students. Now, the last time they told me that, that I was up here, we sat at a table in the dining room and had about 10 students. And that, that was the vision that I had, what I was going to be doing now. I didn't know that so many of you were going to be here, or I would have prepared a lecture on a dress or something like that. I'm not, uh, I'm not capable of preparing a lecture, but I can give a sermonette once in a while. <laughs> and uh, I would have done a little bit more. When I was in Bible school in Florida, they used to have a saying down there that if you're going to be a, a preacher, uh, you ought to be able to, to speak and uh, die at a moment's notice. And uh, so I think that this is uh, the speaking part of it at a moment's notice. <laughs> and uh, perhaps the uh, dying part of it will be on the slick highways going back. <laughs> but be that as it may, it's a privilege for me to be here and to share with you what little bit I may be able to share. I've been asked to tell a little bit about uh, what we have been doing the past few weeks or months and then to start off from there, because I hope we can keep uh, questions along the line of ministry and evangelism and so forth, because if you get into some of the subjects that you're already studying or going to study, I would be lost and wouldn't be able to answer your questions. I have uh, had the opportunity of answering questions for the student bodies at Oxford and Cambridge and even Harvard and uh, MIT and University of Massachusetts and uh, Many of these, uh, well, I suppose nearly all the Ivy League schools, I try to take a tour about every three or four years of the Ivy League schools 
so I can find out what they're thinking. And some of the questions I get asked, I wish you were there to answer them because I have to say, well, I'm sorry, I don't know. I'm going to have to ask one of my colleagues here to help me on that. I was at uh, the academic city in Siberia uh, not too long ago, and uh, that's the second uh, university in the Soviet Union. The first is Moscow University, and the second most important is the academic city where they do all their great research in Siberia. And I had flown there. It was a four uh, time zone change from Moscow there, and you're in an old Russian TU 134, and you wonder if it's going to hold together. And the stewardess said, uh, as we were getting in our seat, she said, please fasten your seat belt, uh, and if we get airborne, you may unfasten them. <laughs> she, she got the if and the when a little bit mixed up. But I felt that before we got there, that the if might have been the more appropriate word. <laughs> but I remember we went there, and they said my first engagement was a debate with the head of the Department of Anthropology. Well, you can imagine how I felt about that. And so here the place was packed and jammed, I'd say a little more than maybe here. And the faculty sat up in the balcony, and they were looking down on this uh, what was to be a debate between him and me. And uh, I barely knew what the word anthropology meant, <laughs> even though I had taken it as a major in college. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I'd had a Russian teacher, and um, his name was Alexander Grigoli. If some of you have ever been to Wheaton, you remember him, because he was uh, certainly a great anthropologist. But be that as it may, uh, he began to show me the maps and how they felt that all the Americans came from the, uh, uh, through the Bering Strait and the, through, through Alaska and down the coast uh, and became what we call today Indians or Native Americans or whatever the latest term is. And I said, I don't think any anthropologist in America would disagree with you. And uh, then I asked him a question. I said, sir, I said, have you found any people anywhere in the world, a tribe or a group of people in any continent that does not believe in God or a God or gods? It may be animist with some leaves rustling in the trees, or it may be Hinduism or Buddhism or Islam or Christianity or Judaism. Have you found anybody in the world that doesn't worship? And he thought for a moment, and he said, no, we never have. I said, but in the beginning, a moment ago, you told me you were an atheist. Now, I found in talking to Soviet leaders everywhere, they usually start out that way. Of course, you know I'm an atheist. They get that on the recorder that's going. And once they get that on the recorder, they can relax and talk a little more freely with you <laughs> about religion, or, and they call it philosophy. And uh, so uh, we talked uh, in those terms, and I said, if you haven't found any people in the world, what do you think, why do you think that is? Why is it that the entire human race worships something, believes that there's something beyond us? And uh, he said, uh, I'm going to ask a couple of my colleagues to speak to that. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, they did, and I didn't understand all that they were saying. But the whole conclusion of the matter was there was no answer. They had no answer as to why the whole human race throughout the world believes in something. I sat beside Mrs. Gorbachev one time for two and a half hours. And I had gone to the ambassador, Dobrynin, who had been the former ambassador. Dobrynin was his successor, but Dobrynin had been here 21 years, and he was the senior ambassador in Washington. And I said, Mr. Ambassador, I said, I'm supposed to sit beside Mrs. Gorbachev for two and a half hours tonight at the table. And I said, what should I talk to her about? And he surprised me. He said, talk to her about religion. He said, that's what she's really interested in. And that's exactly what I did. And, uh, <laughs> and on one side of her sat the president, and uh, across the table, who couldn't hear what we were talking about much, was Tom Brokaw. And uh, I sat beside Mrs. Gorbachev on her right, and then the translator was on his knees between us, going back and forth between me and the president. 
And uh, so in a little while, we got on the subject of religion and philosophy. And she finally ended up by saying, we know that there is something beyond ourselves. We know that there's something up there somewhere that's stronger and greater than we are. And she said, that's as far as I've been able to get in my thinking. Now she, I understand, has gone much further than that, but she couldn't say it at that moment at that table. But I just found very few real atheists in my conversations with those people. In fact, I found since we, we saw, Mr. I saw Mr. Gorbachev alone for two, two weeks before the coup for an hour, and then the next day I saw Mr. Yeltsin alone for an hour and a half, or hour and a quarter it was, and this was just one or two weeks before the coup. And Yeltsin said to me, he said, I've given up atheism. I've given up communism. And he said, my grandchildren are wearing crosses and I'm delighted. And I thought it was very interesting because he had had the new patriarch, Alexis, patriarch of the Orthodox Church. And I, every time I'd gone to the Soviet Union four times to preach, I'd gone sponsored by the Orthodox Church. I was their official guest. And I went from one great cathedral to the other, and they would have their liturgy, and then I would preach the gospel as straight as I knew how. And his, the predecessor to him, to, uh, to uh, Alexis, was named Piman. And I had preached in his cathedral in Moscow, a great, beautiful cathedral, and I'd preached on you must be born again, as straight as I knew how, and gave an invitation for people to lift their hands if they were not sure that they knew Christ. And it seemed that almost every hand was lifted. And when I sat down, the patriarch, who's stronger in the Orthodox Church than the Pope is in the Roman Catholic Church, he stood up and he had a staff in his hand and he pounded it. And he said, I want Mr. Graham to promise that he'll come back here and teach our students and teach our ministers how to preach like that. He said, that's the kind of sermons we need. He said, we need to know how to know God and how to talk to God and how to have a new heart and a new life. And he sat down. So we accepted that invitation. And that's why last summer we held a school of evangelism in Moscow. And we had 5,000 clergy. And they paid their own way to the University of Moscow. And the university housed them and fed them. We paid the university, of course. And then we met in one of the auditoriums in the great Lenin Stadium complex. And I have never seen so many tears. I've never seen. We gave each one a Bible. And it was hard to get them to bring their Bibles from their dormitory rooms to the plenary sessions because they were afraid they'd get wet or they were afraid somebody would steal them. They were so anxious to have those Bibles. And when you hear organizations, and there are many of them now that are distributing Bibles in the Soviet Union, you just thank God because they are needed, they're wanted, the people are hungry for it, and they, they, they grab for it as though it were bread that they'd never tasted before, or water that they'd never drunk before, which it is true spiritually. And so let's pray for the people of not only them, but pray for the, the people of Eastern Europe and that have undergone these tremendous changes. And there are changes in other parts of the world. We're going to go to a country, God willing, in about a month, a little over a month, that is the most closed country in the entire world to the gospel. And we've been invited by the president or the leader. Uh, they have no television that will televise anything except what they want them to televise. They have no radio except it's tuned to their station. And uh, there are no Bibles. They now have two or three churches open. I'm going to be speaking at the university and will be speaking at those two churches and seeing the political leadership. I've talked to Mr. Bush about it. I'm going to see Mr. Bush this week in Washington and Jim Baker, the Secretary of State. And it looks like we're going if physically I can hold up. That's the big problem I'm facing now with so many opportunities like that. I'm not saying any of that to boast about me. I am nothing, and I don't know why these things are coming. I have no idea, but God is allowing, and God is preparing the way, and people are praying, 
And I believe the Holy Spirit is greatly at work in spite of the work of the devil. I've never seen such evil in the world as we see today. You turn on the television today, I go to the motion pictures, and you can just see what, how Satan is working. And behind the scenes he's working in a way I have not seen before. And people ask me about that. And I tell them the Lord taught that the wheat and the tares will grow together. They're not going to stand still. They'll grow. Evil will get worse. Good will get better. And that's exactly what we're seeing now. And I believe as many people tell me and as many people think as I travel about that we are approaching the end of the age and that Christ is going to come back and set up his kingdom. That's the hope in my heart. But I know we have many different differences at that point as to how it's going to be and exactly when it's going to be. And there's a great deal of uh, apocalyptic uh, literature that we could turn to. And there's a lot of it coming out. You go to the average bookstore today, to Waldron's or any of those big bookstores, and you'll see quite a number of uh, books on, on that subject. Well, pardon me, I've talked too long. I could talk all evening. <laughs> And uh, I need to talk to Haddon Robinson first. <laughs> they told me to sit down. <laughs> this is a wonderful opportunity for us to have dialogue with Dr. Graham. So I'll ask the students if you have a question you'd like to ask Dr. Graham along the line that he shared. We'll uh, get the microphone to you. Just let me know. All right. Hi, Dr. Graham. It's great to have you here today. I know that all of us appreciate your taking this time. Thank you. My question, I have a preface to it, and then I'll ask the question. Uh, the situation that we have right now, Dr. Christy Wilson is retiring um, this spring, and he is one of the few professors that is a professor of evangelism. I guess purely he's the only professor of evangelism. And he also, as an individual, has waved the banner of evangelism for us and encouraging people to participate personally in evangelism and also globally. And my concern is that with him being gone, also, secondly, second part of this is that as an institution, we don't have a requirement in evangelism. There is a requirement in missions, but not in evangelism. And we're one of only two or three seminaries that are the evangelical non-denominational seminaries that... Um, do not have a requirement in evangelism. And I know this is an important issue to you. And so my question is, is if there's a possible way that you could influence... Um, <laughs> the Board of Trustees as well as the um, faculty um, advisor and, and the committees that make those decisions in terms of what we'll be required to take. Another issue that concerns me, it's a great thing, but it, it also has to be handled properly, and th is that our seminary is expanding with lots of new programs, which is wonderful and attracts a lot of people. But also with that is the possibility that it's more difficult to require certain courses. And just uh, to maintain the issue of A.J. Gordon's vision, um, I just think there's a number of people that, that would agree with me, I hope there is anyway, to see a continued requirement in missions or evangelism, especially in the MDiv degree, possibly for both evangelism and missions. Most people aren't trained in how to share their faith personally, and um, it's just a big issue. So I want to be sure to make it a real clear point for you to emphasize. Well, I, I would like to answer that by saying that I have uh, read the current issue of the catalog from one end to the other to see what the subjects were and what was written under the subjects. And I've talked to a lot of people from Gordon Conwell. And I think from the very beginning that Gordon Conwell's faculty and curriculum has been directed toward evangelism and missions. You may be taking homiletics or you may be taking something else. But uh, I think that uh, the whole thing is toward evangelism and missions. You can look across New England and I don't know how many churches there are now, but there are many churches that were once uh, not evangelical churches uh, that are today evangelical churches uh, because of Gordon Conwell. And Gordon Conwell has placed these young men and women there uh, that have turned whole churches and whole communities around. We toured New England back in 1950. Uh, we spent six weeks here going from town to town and city to city. And I was absolutely brokenhearted at some of the ministers and people that I saw that were pastors of churches. Today, 
the last tour we took, which was maybe five or six years ago, from one town to the other in the various universities of New England, I was thrilled at the people that came up to me and said their church was changed, it was different, had a new influence, because a person from Gordon Conwell had gone there to be the minister. So I'm very proud of Gordon Conwell's uh, uh, history when it comes to, and its effectiveness as far as evangelism. I don't think you have to have a course called evangelism uh, to, to make uh, people conscious of their need of evangelism because whatever course we're taking, it's directed toward preparing us uh, for, for evangelism and for teaching and preaching of, that has evangelism in it, whether it's called evangelism or not. Thank you. I'm wondering what you think about the use of seeker services or, or that particular model in our churches today, in established churches or in establishing new churches that are oriented towards seeker services. Would you say that again? You know, my left ear is almost <laughs> deaf, and I don't have a hearing aid in it. I, I've got one with me, but I'm always embarrassed to wear it. <laughs> I'm just getting used to it. If you'll speak a little okay. loud and more distinctly, I'll I'm try. curious about your opinion or your, your opinion on the use of seeker services in established churches today uh, seeker services that are directed towards the unchurched, the Willow Creek sort of model, the Saddleback sort of model, um, and, and how those can be used as evangelism tools. Is that a legitimate tool, in your opinion? Do you know you're telling me something that I don't know much about? <laughs> and uh, I don't think I could give you a very adequate answer until I could sit down and have a conversation with you about it and you could explain it a little more what you mean, because I really don't quite understand the question. It's my fault, not yours. <laughs> Dr. Graham, I'd like to ask you a few questions. <laughs> you must be an evangelist. <laughs> if God wills. Uh, three questions, very briefly, all three. The first is, dovetailing on Marty's question, what do you see is the greatest obstacle toward evangelizing the world by the year 2000 in light of various movements such as AD 2000, et cetera? The second would be, how do you see Gordon Conwell being used in that way? And especially in light of our history, uh, in light of our founder, uh, A.J. Gordon, who once said that our task is not to uh, bring Christ, or not to bring the world to Christ, but to bring Christ to the world. And in light of the situation, as Marty said, uh, J. Christie Wilson uh, retiring in May, the other missions professor, Gary Becker, on sabbatical uh, for the fall. And so basically our missions program, missions core people, have been eliminated for the fall. And so I was wondering how you might see the school equipping men and women to evangelize the world in light of those circumstances. And third, will you join us for graduation on May 8th? <laughs> Well, thank you. I think that um, most of us realize that we have been called uh, to go out into the world and proclaim the gospel. And any proclamation of the gospel is evangelism and uh, missions. We've got a, another evangelist. <laughs> and uh, I think that if I were in seminary today or in a Bible school, uh, I would spend my time studying. The greatest uh, mistake that I've made in my life is the lack of study. You know, when I, even when I was in school, I would go and preach every weekend and come back and uh, do a little bit of studying and so forth, and I got through school all right, but barely. And uh, since then, I've taken so many engagements around the world and have not studied enough, not stopped and thought enough. I've spent a lot of time on airplanes trying to think through different things, but uh, a motor would catch on fire or uh, the tires would blow out or something would happen. I think everything that can happen to a person in an airplane has happened to me. I've been across the Atlantic twice now when the motor blew out, just in the last two years on a jet airplane. And uh, so I know that's the devil disturbing me, so I can't think through anything. And, uh, but I would say 
that ask God to give you studying grace. Uh, because a lot of students will, will go to school and they say that I've got to get out there and do this and do that, time is short and so forth. If I knew that the Lord was going to come back in, in three years and I had two years to study, I wouldn't get up and start running up and down the streets of Boston preaching the gospel. I'd stay here and study and prepare in the place that God put you because you must be ready for what he has ahead of you and you must be prepared and you've come here to prepare and it takes a special grace from God to prepare. It takes patience. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit. It takes the anointing and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Just like I have to have the power of the Holy Spirit to preach, I have to have the anointing of the Holy Spirit to proclaim his message with a love and a passion and a compassion. And you must have that same anointing of the Holy Spirit to be a faithful student or a faithful faculty member. Hi, Dr. Gray, my name is Alex Kish. I'm a third year MDF student here. and. I'm in process with the Southern Baptist Foreign Mission Board. I spent uh, seven months last year. Would you speak a little louder? Okay, please? I spent uh, seven months last year ministering in a Hungarian Baptist church in Baia, Hungary, two hours directly south of Budapest. I have several friends in Hungary who are very appreciative of your work in both Hungary and in Romania. I was wondering what future plans you have uh, to follow up your very successful campaigns in Budapest well, two years ago, I believe, in uh, your work in Romania, and if possible, if I could tag along. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, my, uh, my first uh, visit to Eastern Europe came in 1960, uh, 1967, when we went to Yugoslavia and to Croatia and preached the gospel in Zagreb, and then the big thrust came uh, a short time later when we were able to go to Hungary and tour the various cities of Hungary. And I'll never forget in Page, it's spell, spelled P-E-C-E-S, -E -S, but they pronounce it Page. And I remember the Catholic Archbishop introducing me to 50,000 people. Uh, he was introducing me from the steps of the capital, uh, of, of his cathedral. And uh, in those countries, we, get a, we try to get everybody to cooperate. And when we held the big meeting in Hungary about three years ago, and a hundred and some thousand people, the Catholic uh, uh, cardinal read the scriptures. Uh, the reformed, uh, the leader of the reformed church participated, and different denominations participated. But when I got up, I just preached the straight gospel because they weren't, uh, if there's any compromise in it, it was them compromising, not me. And uh, you go to those places where it's been ruled by the communists and you're just glad to hear anybody talk about Jesus, whatever his background is. And uh, so it teaches us a great deal of love and tolerance toward people who don't hold our views. And uh, it was made very clear that we didn't hold their views and that we were come together as a Christian witness, and it wasn't uh, just an event. But when I gave the invitation, about a third of the audience started forward, and I knew they'd misunderstood what I'd said, so I asked them to go back to their seats. And they went back to their seats, but then they came forward again. And we fortunately had enough literature, and the counselors who had been prepared had to throw it to them by the thousands. I think there were 37,000 people that came forward that day to make their commitment to Christ. And then it was carried live on Hungarian television two or three days later. And uh, another great batch of mail came in of people receiving Christ as their Lord and Savior. And now we have an opportunity to go into the Soviet Union every week on channel number one. That's their main channel with the gospel of Christ at prime evening time. Now some people will take time early in the morning and so forth. We want it at prime time. You will never see us normally, if we have anything to do with it, on in the, in the daytime or on Sunday morning or any time like that. We try to take prime evening time. And that's the way we're doing in Eastern Europe as well. I don't know whether that answered your question because I didn't hear it all. <laughs> Dr. Graham, I'd like to ask you, um, I, 
as we minister, we find out how important prayer is and how important it is to have someone standing with you in prayer. And I know that you attribute most of the success of your ministry to people who have been praying for you. But I'm curious, if I were to be with you alone, what I would ask you is, could you comment and perhaps give us an, uh, an anecdote or something uh, on, on your relationship with Dr. Stephen Olford as being a prayer partner? Um, could, you, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, so Stephen and I have been friends for many years. Uh, he was, the um, first time I ever met him was at Hildenborough Hall and just outside of London in 1946, the year after the war. And he was with Tom Reese. And Tom Reese had invited a group of us in Youth for Christ to come over and uh, tell them about Youth for Christ in America to see if they couldn't get something similar going in Great Britain. Tom Reese was a, a fairly wealthy man and he uh, had the largest evangelistic rallies at that time in Britain and Stephen was helping him. Stephen was born and reared in Africa, and uh, his father and mother now lived in Cardiff, Wales, and he was in, in Wales, he's a Welshman. And uh, he was to, to be the opening speaker that night of the conference, and I never heard such a powerful address as he, as he gave. And so after the meeting was over, I asked him if he was going to be in Wales in the next few days because we were going to Wales, and he said yes. So we went down there and we had a day with him. I had a day with him and just fell in love with him. And we've been very close personal friends ever since. And we've prayed together a lot. And uh, then I began to become acquainted with the Keswick uh, message and the Keswick teaching. And I became a speaker at Keswick. I gave their 100th anniversary address and um, read the books. And Stephen was a very strong Keswick speaker for young people at that time. He now is in Memphis uh, with a program in which he trains young pastors to be preachers. And uh, his, uh, if he has a failing, and I don't know that he does, it may be it's my failing, uh, but he preaches too long. <laughs> and uh, it's hard for Stephen to preach less than an hour to hour and a half. And I've tried to limit my preaching now to 35 minutes because I find that the, with television and all these other things that, and you read the Sermon on the Mount, how long does it take you to read it? Uh, Jesus uh, didn't uh, spend uh, all day long, on, of course that was all put together probably and from different uh, messages that he brought, there's big discussion about that, but uh, all the Ten Commandments, or any of those great uh, things in scripture are very brief and the prayers of our Lord in public were brief, but in private, uh, he uh, spent all night in prayer. And I think that should be our pattern. But we certainly need prayer, and I think that, that I can feel it and sense it when I'm up speaking. I can just sense prayer, because around the world, people now know about us, they pray for us. We get hundreds and thousands of letters that say we pray for you daily. And I'd rather have their prayers than their money or anything else. Dr. Graham, I wonder, as you look at the evangelical church in America, what are your deepest concerns? Well, it's according to what we mean by the word evangelical. The word evangelical has changed uh, so the, and uh, has become so... Uh, fuzzy that we hardly know how to uh, define an evangelical. To me, an evangelical is a person who believes the Bible to be the Word of God, who takes the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed as the basis of his theology or of some of the other creeds of the church. And uh, then uh, uh, there's an emotional part to being an evangelical, and that is our love for the person of Christ. We love God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, but there's a centrality of the second person of the Godhead that's in the heart and mind of the, of the evangelical. And then uh, the third thing that I would describe as an evangelical would be a person who, uh, who proclaims the gospel, who is evangelistic, who, who loves other people, and whether he does it through social work or social, emphasis on social justice or in the proclamation of the cross, 
He starts with the cross, but then it goes out in a horizontal way as well. And I would say that the state of the evangelical in America is, is good, much far better than it was when I started out. Uh, there's just thousands of evangelical pastors across this country and evangelical leaders, and I think a part of it has come from the parachurch organizations, and that has spurred the denominations. And now I know denominations are splitting and dividing, and in my own denomination we're having all sorts of ups and downs and divisions about it. But uh, by and large, the evangelicals are holding fast, and they're stronger than ever. Dr. Graham, I was just wondering if you could uh, share with us who are preparing for ministry or those who have ministry now, uh, what are the, some of the most important lessons you've learned about ministry in your ministering down through the years? Well, we've just talked about one of them, and that is prayer. And I would say that the most important thing that you can learn and develop is a daily devotional life that is... Uh, reading the scriptures. For many years I have had the practice of reading five psalms a day and one chapter of Proverbs a day. Five psalms teaches me how to get along with God. And you see the ups and the downs of David and Alsop and the others that wrote the psalms. And then you come to Proverbs and that teaches you how to get along with man. And you can read them both through one chapter of Proverbs a day and five chapters of psalms a day in one month, so read them over and over and over again. In addition to the other reading and the other studies, my wife and I this year are, have adopted the, uh, the epistles, the prison epistles for our daily devotional time. And we just finished the book of Isaiah. And uh, I would think that uh, to get on your knees and feel with those men that wrote it and feel with what they were saying is one thing. Then the second thing I would say is learn how to lead a person to Christ personally. You know, it's easy to get up on a platform and preach an evangelistic sermon, but to sit face to face with a man and say, will you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior? Will you sign on the dotted line? Will you shake my hand and say that you're going to receive him and you'll pray this little prayer after me and get on your knees and pray with him? That's an important thing to learn. And that's one reason that I back Bill Bright and, and the work of Campus Crusade and those four spiritual laws. Of course, they were put out by Bob Jones a long time before Bill Bright came along. And then before Bob Jones, about the turn of the century, another man had those same four points, but they're good. And I adopted them. We have four steps to peace with God. And so I think that it's that, that, those, that those are very good little helps in winning a person to Jesus Christ. And then I would also practice something that I've not always practiced. And that is I would try to leave a little tract or a little uh, something about the Lord with almost everybody that I meet, whether it's somebody at the toll gate or somebody in the hotel or wherever it is, uh, and tell them what it means to be a Christian, why they should become a Christian, and you're scattering the Word of God. And during the uh, uh, desert storm, uh, my son got the idea of uh, sending thousands and several million Arabic tracts uh, to the, the soldiers. And uh, they, he said in his letter to them, he said, you may want to learn Arabic. And the best way to learn Arabic would be to take these scriptures and these passages that may be familiar to you and get an Arabic person that you meet and get him to teach you. And, so, and then he said, if you throw it away, just throw it away, it'll be buried in the sand and someday some Arab will come and get that and read it. And just all kinds of little ways that people have thought of to get the Word of God out because there's power in the Word. I could go on with a lot of other points, but... Thank you, Dr. Graham. I have a tendency to go too long on each one. Dr. Graham, um, it's obvious throughout the history of your ministry and even most recently that you have a lot of accessibility to political leaders. 
around the, the world. And is my understanding that you were with President Bush the night before we made a decision to go to war. And I was wondering just what that's like um, to be a part of, of all of that, what it's been like for you to be with leaders as they've made important decisions and uh, just a little, to know a little bit about that. Thank you. I'm very glad you asked that because I've been asked that uh, before and I'd like to tell you the story. Uh, I was at home that day and uh, we were working on a, on a, I think I was working on my memoirs as a matter of fact. And a call came uh, asking me if I could come and have lunch with Secretary Baker and the President alone. And I said, no, there's no way in the world we can make it because it takes us 40 minutes to get to the airport and then it's an, even if it's a private plane, it takes us an hour and a half to get to Washington. So we turned it down. Then the call came back about an hour later and said the president would like you to have dinner with him. He wants to have dinner with you alone. <laughs> so I said, well, we can do that if we have a private plane. So we had a private plane and they picked us up and uh, I went to uh, Washington and I was to, it was about uh, 4.30 in the afternoon when I arrived at the White House and they took me up to the second floor of the Lincoln Room. On the second floor is the, is the, are the quarters of the President and his family and you have the Lincoln Room and the Queen's Room and you have the Blue Room. You have several of those rooms and then on the third floor you have sort of hotel rooms where guests stay. They've always put me in the Lincoln Room of the, I've been there for several presidents. I, sp I think there's about 20 some uh, under Johnson. He always wanted somebody near him that was a preacher. <laughs> <laughs> and I can assure you he needed somebody like that. <laughs> I preached his funeral and I told that. But uh, be that as it may, as it may uh, I got there and I was sitting there watching CNN on the television that was in the room. They had it on. And a knock came at the door and I went to the door and there was Mrs. Bush alone. And she was in her wheelchair. She had been hurt in a skiing accident. And uh, she said, Billy, would you push me up to the Blue Room? And I've known the Bushes for 25 years. We've been very close family friends. And... Uh, so I said, certainly. So I pushed up to the blue room and we sat down and we were talking and visiting. And all of a sudden the man on the television said, it looks like anti-aircraft fire from Baghdad. And uh, he kept on talking in that vein for about five minutes and I turned to her and I said, Barbara, I said, is this the beginning of the war? And she didn't say anything, but I could tell by the way she looked that that was it. And about a half an hour later, the president came in He'd come from his office, and he said, now you know, and I won't quote what all he said. And uh, then uh, I said, let's have prayer. And we had prayer together, the three of us. And then we went, to, they said dinner was served, so the three of us went to dinner, just the three of us. And uh, in the little private dining room. And we had another prayer. And then during the dinner, uh, somebody came in and said, this is a copy of your speech. We want you to go over it one more time. He had to speak at nine o'clock to the nation and tell them about the beginning of the war. And uh, when the man left, I said, could we have another prayer? <laughs> and because I was very concerned and very burdened. I was thinking about all those men that might be slaughtered. We'd had so many uh, negative reports. And uh, then he left to go over to, the, uh, to his office to give his speech and uh, we had another prayer, praying that God would give him liberty and say the right thing to the people. And then he came back and he said, Billy, he said, I, I'd like for you to do something for me. I said, what is it? He said, I'd like to have a service tomorrow morning at nine o'clock at Fort Myers and I'll have all the cabinet there I'll have the heads of all the armed forces, Colin Powell and Dick Cheney, all these people will be there. And we'll have about three or four hundred Marines in. We'll have the Marines sing. And then he said, uh, 
the three chaplains, three heads of the, of the chaplains' corps will be there to read the scriptures and to pray and so forth, but I want you to preach to us. He said, what, what subject would you like to have? <laughs> I, I said, I want to speak on the subject. If, if I'm to speak, I want to speak on the subject of peace. So they called it a service for peace. And uh, they had a little bulletin already printed. And uh, <laughs> no, not, not before the conversation. <laughs> They, I think they stayed up half the night, the chaplain's call, printing that little bulletin. But we went out there and had a nice little service and came back, and that was the total extent of my involvement in that war. Dr. And it's Rick. interesting, I'd like to say this, that President Bush has never discussed politics with me, and he never discussed whether to go into this war or not. He never asked me a question and I didn't volunteer any advice. Dr. Graham, I want to turn from White House to Kremlin again, because I came two years ago from Russia, and I am excited that you, half of your introduction tell us about Russia and what's going on there, among Christians especially. A few seminaries in, in the United States, they already involved with their, with their professors to in teaching in Russia and so on. How, your, how is your vision then? Gordon Conwell could be involved in such a very important things now. I didn't understand all that. How, how could, what is your vision for how Gordon Conwell may be involved in uh, ministry in Russia? I think Gordon Conwell is probably already very involved in uh, former students that are in these various organizations that are working in Russia. We have so many organizations that are working there. In fact, some of the pastors last summer told me that there are too many Americans representing too many organizations. And he said they come over here and they tell about our needs and they take pictures and they go back to America to raise money. And said they also offer money to our leaders more than they could ever earn in, in, in a year. They offer them uh, for one week uh, to work with them and to help them. And this is a real danger that we go over and exploit them. Uh, this is a, a minority that's doing this, but there are some that have done that and are still doing it. And it causes great confusion among the Christians in the Soviet Union, or in uh, Russia, as well as the Ukraine and other places. Dr. Graham, I was told to keep this uh, revolving around ministry or Jack was gonna pull the mic. <laughs> what I'd like to ask on this side of your view, most of us have dreams and aspirations and thoughts, and I myself have difficulty imagining the places you've been and the people you've seen, and let alone the numbers of sermons that you've delivered. So my question is, in your life yet ahead of you, what is your greatest ambition in terms of your own ministry? To get to heaven. <laughs> I'm certain that that's where I'm going. <laughs> Not because of me. I'm a sinner saved by grace, thank God. But I'm going because of what Christ did on the cross and by his resurrection. Dr. Graham, thank you very much for your time with us. Uh, you've talked about how the spirit of communism has, has been uh, destroyed by the power of God. There's another spiritual giant of evil Islam, and I'm wondering uh, what you see in the future for how we can kill this giant with the Spirit of God. This needs to be uh, the subject of, of our prayers as much as anything in the world today, because Islam is growing much faster than Christianity in relation to the world population. And uh, they are very dedicated. Of course, there are different kinds of people. There's the Shiites and the Sunnis and other splinter groups in Islam. They're not all united as we may think they are. But it's, um, for example, in Egypt right now, they are, I believe, arresting 
uh, some Islamic leaders because they're too fervent. Uh, the same is true in Algeria. It, it, it almost has became a Islamic republic, very much like Iran, with the same, they would live by Islamic law. And yet, I hear of constant stories of people coming to know Christ that are former Muslims. And I think that uh, we shouldn't give up because they are, they are strong and they, they, they don't really know the grounds of their beliefs. Most of them have not read the Koran. They've read excerpts from it and parts of it. And uh, I had a man that traveled with me for many years. His name is Agba Haq. Maybe he's been here to speak. He's from India. And he traveled with me for oh, the last 30 years. And he got his doctor's degree at Northwestern University in Islamic studies. His father was an Islamic priest. Uh, he himself was president of the Henry Martin School of Islamic Studies in New Delhi. And I considered him the greatest authority I'd ever met on Islam. And uh, he, I would like to suggest, sir, that he be invited here to speak sometime because he's a powerful speaker with a British accent, good looking, <laughs> and uh, he really knows Islam and he knows the answers to Islam. And if he could have sat down with the president and the cabinet and explained what they were up against in that war as he did to our office in Minneapolis, I think uh, they would have thought twice on some of the things that they did. Dr. Graham, are there uh, four or five things you could mention that we could be praying for you, um, just for your ministry? There's a number of us who pray for you regularly, and are there items especially that you'd like us to be covering for you in prayer? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Alan Emery is here. He's on this board as well and he's chairman of our executive committee, and I'm sure he would, we have a board of 27 men and women, and uh, I believe, I can say without any contradiction, that we have the strongest board and uh, the tightest run financial organization in the country, secular or religious. And it's been because of this board that has been so strong. And another one of, we have seven members of our board on the board of Gordon Conwell. So we have that relationship with you all. So if we need money, all we have to do is ask Dr. Cooley. <laughs> <laughs> how to raise money. He does such a wonderful job in whatever he tackles. And every one of us is so proud of him. Yes, you could pray also for our physical condition. My wife and I both are past 70. I'm 73 and she's 70. And uh, I didn't really notice that I was beginning to slow down in my body until I was about 67 or 68. And I began to realize I couldn't do the things I did at 38. And today I can't do the things that I did when I was a young man of 65. And uh, yet the opportunities uh, for both of us to write and to speak here and there are, are greater than ever. And we just, we need your prayers that God will show us what our priorities are. I'm trying to write my memoirs. I'm not sure they'll ever get finished. I've got the outline finished. That's about as far as we've gotten. And I have the help of one man, but I need about four or five right now if we're gonna get finished before the Lord takes me to heaven and they may not be worth reading. I'm trying to pass on to the next generation of young people like you uh, the, what we did, how we did it, the mistakes we made, the things that you shouldn't make, and uh, uh, try to keep it interesting at the same time, tell about our opportunities in all parts of the world because I've toured all the continents. I've been now, I've preached to health crusades in 84 countries. And so you learn a little something as you go along and it's been my privilege to preach in all kinds of interesting situations, whether it's a prison or in Buck at Buckingham Palace or at Windsor Park or wherever, and uh, various universities. I remember the first time that I had a question and answer period with the faculty at Oxford. I'll tell you about that sometime. 
that was very interesting because three or four times I said, I don't know the answer to that question. And when I said that, the audience applauded. I don't know why. <laughs> and uh, all the times that I had with C.S. Lewis and people of that caliber, of Emil Bruna, or some of those great theologians, and I'd spent days with them. I took a vacation with uh, Dr. Uh, Carl, uh, he was a great theologian from Baal. Who? Yeah, Karl Barth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm embarrassed. You see, that's age. But he was a wonderful friend, and I remember when we took a holiday together up in the mountains of Switzerland, and uh, he said, you're going to come to Baal to preach. And he said, I want to tell you something. He said, you won't uh, have very many people to hear you. And then if you give an invitation, nobody will respond. So the night that I went to Ball, he was there, and it was pouring rain like it is tonight. And he was sitting there with a big umbrella over him and an old trench coat. And I looked at him, and we had 15,000 people, which is about <laughs> four times what they expected. I gave an invitation, and about five or 600 people responded. And the next day, I had lunch with him. And he said, well, he said, that meeting last night was a great surprise to me. But he said, there was one thing that you did that I did not like, one thing that you said. I said, what is that? He said, you said, we must be born again. Now, he said, I believe in being born again, but he said, I don't like that word must. So a few days later, I had lunch with Emil Bruna over in Zurich. And... Uh, I told him about that experience, and he said, don't ever preach without saying you must be born again. Because <laughs> he and Bart did not get along, as you know. <laughs> so that was another difference of opinion between them. Thank you very much, Mr. Graham, for sharing this conversation uh, with us. Uh, in a moment, uh, George Ray, a graduate of our seminary here, in 1981, I believe, 82. 82, I missed by year, is going to lead us in prayer, and we're going to pray for you and your ministry. But we do want to thank you for uh, sharing these comments with us. You have shared your vision, and you have done so uh, with knowledge, and you've shared some anecdote with a little humor. And we appreciate that so very much. Thank you. George? Thank you, sir. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we rejoice in this evening and we thank you, Father, for this man that you have raised up by your hand to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. I pray that in the name of Jesus Christ that your healing power would rest upon him and that your strength would be imparted to his being, that he might continue, O oh Lord, to rejoice in you and to sow the seeds of your love to the uttermost parts of the earth. And I pray a double portion of the Spirit of God that is upon this man will come upon the student body at Gordon-Conwell. And Father, that many might be raised up, O Lord, to go forth even as he has done, to carry forth this ministry in greater power and in greater authority. Father, may it be so in Jesus' name. And may you be glorified in all of our lives, Father, as we go forth in your love through Christ, who is our Savior and our soon and coming King. Amen. Before you go, I would like to wish all of you a wonderful, do I call it winter or spring term? Anyway, spring, we're going to go with that. And I trust that you'll have a marvelous time in study and prayer. Tomorrow morning, we will gather for worship here in the chapel at 940, and Dr. Leighton Ford will be giving uh, the sermon in that hour, and I trust you will be present. God bless you and give you a marvelous evening.